Hey, um, today I'm going to talk to you about what to do after you get cash. Um, I think the reality is that in Bulgaria today, it's, it's actually really easy to get funding. Um, you know, there's Launch Hub, Eleven, Nevec, there's EU funding, there's kind of bank loans, Asian investors, grants, competitions. It should be easy. Um, the community has kind of radically changed in the past three years that I've lived here. Um, you know, it, it now has significant identity. Three years ago, it pretty much didn't exist. There's kind of amazing success stories now. Startups are really on the agenda, which is, which is really cool. Um, there's kind of a real buzzing network and, you know, events like this, which, which didn't exist a couple of years ago. So, I actually really believe that today there's actually more money than startups to invest in. Um, I'm part of the investment committee of Launch Hub, and you know, I, I know there that it's pretty challenging for us to find these kind of amazing startups where, where we want to invest ultimately. Um, so, I reckon that if you've got a great idea today and you can execute, you shouldn't have an excuse not to start now. You should just get on with it and do it today. Um, <coughs> In the past couple of years, pitching, presenting, and raising money has kind of been a key topic, and you know, it's, it's what we've been all talking about. Every single startup conference that I've been to has been about you know, how you pitch and how you present and you know, what you need to do. But I think you know, the story actually starts when you raise money or you know, when you kind of have that idea and you, you, you're ready to go at it, whether you've raised money from angels or investors or whatever it is. Um, so today, my lecture is a little bit about my story um, the kind of challenges, successes, failures, and lessons that I learned um, over the past couple of years. So, my name is Adele Zakut. I'm, I'm an architect turned entrepreneur. Um, I was born in Dubai, uh, kind of grew up there, moved to London, studied architecture, uh, and then I moved to Bulgaria three years ago. And I, I've had a, quite a few kind of unsuccessful businesses and unsuccessful ideas that I've, that I've done. Um, but the three that kind of still remain today are Dispark which is a digital agency. Um, we kind of co-founded that with Luchu, uh, who's my partner, and you know, we build websites, mobile apps, and stuff like that for startups and just cool brands worldwide. Um, the second is Open Buildings and Clippings. So Open Buildings is a Wikipedia for architecture. It's an archive of buildings worldwide, and Clippings is an online marketplace with beautiful home products. Um, we're venture-backed, so Index Ventures and Blue Run Ventures invested $2.6 million in us um, to date, uh, and they're kind of still chugging along. And then Boom Burgers and Steaks, which um, basically when I moved back from London, the one thing that I really missed was a really good burger in Sofia. Um, so I got together with a couple of friends and we, we opened Boom last year, um, and it's kind of been doing really well so far. Um, so I studied architecture, yet I don't actually work as an architect. And every couple of weeks I get a phone call from my dad, who's also an architect. And you know the call is something along the lines of, so you studied architecture for six years, you know, when are you actually going to start building stuff? <laughs> um, but I, I think that my education taught me a couple of things that are really crucial to me as an entrepreneur. Um, and there's a lot of parallels between architecture and what I do today. Um, the first is vision and the importance of vision. When, when you get a design brief for a building, um, you know, you, you kind of as an architect, you set out that vision. You kind of try and figure out what you want to do with that space, what you want to do in terms of concept, program, etc. And I think vision is really crucial, you know, both in architecture but also in the startup world. Without a vision, you, you can't make decisions. You need a vision in order to guide you on the kind of treacherous path of um, entrepreneurship. Um, so you really need to know what that vision is and what exactly, um, uh, kind of how you can achieve it. And then the second is perseverance. Um, you need to be able to persevere in, in architecture and in the startup world. Um, I, I studied architecture at the Architectural Association in London, which is a kind of really, it's a really tough school. Um, you know, I, I had none of the kind of typical student life of, uh, you know, partying all night long and, and all of that. It was basically working all night long, you know, kind of waking up at six, seven, eight, and just working through the night. Because the way that the AA works is that everything um, kind of ends on, on what's called a table or a review at the end of the year. So you don't get grades, you don't get anything like that. Um, at the end of the year, you just present everything you've done for the past nine months, and you either pass or you fail. So you've got to persevere and you've got to kind of iterate and you know, work on that project and believe in that vision um, in order to be able to deliver on that one date. If you don't, you just repeat the year. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, and that's very, very relevant in the startup world. <coughs> you know, you, 
you've got to keep that end goal in sight so that you can continue and, uh, and move forward. The Anna Karenina principle states that happy families are all alike, whilst every unhappy, unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Um, basically, what this says is very relevant to the startup world. I think that every successful startup is successful in the same way. Everyone gets it right in exactly the same way. Successful startups do follow a very specific um, path, I guess. And every unsuccessful startup is unsuccessful in its own unique way. You know, whether you kind of hired the wrong person or you didn't have that good idea or, you know, the product sucked or whatever it is, there's a million ways to fail a startup, but you need to get all those million reasons right um, in order to be successful. And, you know, there's no such thing as an overnight success. It's, it's so easy to um, read the stories on TechCrunch or kind of look at that Forbes cover and, you know, kind of learn about the story of all these successful startup entrepreneurs. But actually, um, yeah, uh, there's no such thing as an overnight success. All of those people have gone through hell and they've come back and, you know, they've been able to persevere in order to, for you guys to read about them today. So a couple of examples, Angry Birds. A lot of you probably know about this, but it's the 50-second game that Rovio created. Um, they went through bankruptcy and eight years of iteration in order to, uh, to create Angry Birds. Pinterest. Um, for two years, they had absolutely no growth. Um, the kind of after the first nine, ten months, you know, they had less than 10,000 users. A very small percentage were actually using the platform. You know, there was no retention. They were kind of pitching to investors, and nobody believed in them. Look at where they are today. Airbnb. They had this vision. And you know they tried to kind of pitch this vision to investors for two years. Nobody believed in them. You know they thought they were crazy. Um, for two years they had no money, they had no traction. The founders were kind of living in constant credit card debt. And again, look at where they are today. And this isn't just relevant for the kind of internet and for you know um, internet startups or tech startups. It's also in the real world. Um, WD40, which is a kind of really famous spray. Um, that you you know used to kind of uh, it's it's called the water displacing 40. It's basically it's called water displacing 40 because the other 39 were failures. So they iterated through 39 different options, and you know finally got to it. And then my favorite, the Dyson vacuum cleaner. James Dyson created 5,126 prototypes of that vacuum cleaner until he was successful. You know that's crazy. I mean. God rewards fools. I think that's a really relevant statement for us. You know, you've got to be a real fool to work on a vacuum cleaner for 5,100, create 5,126 vacuum cleaners to kind of get to success. Um, you've got to be a real fool to uh, kind of work in 52 games for eight years, you know, on bankruptcy in order to succeed. But it's exactly that, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have this vision and you believe in it and you persevere because you know that at one point, You'll get there, you believe in that. <coughs> I think the Trough of Sorrow um, by Paul Graham at Y Combinator really represents that process of a startup. Um, and it's, you know, this, this trough is what every single startup goes, goes through. And ultimately, if you're able to get past the Trough of Sorrow, um, you're kind of on your way to possibly and hopefully succeeding. Um, but most startups fail, you know, somewhere around there. So, you know, you start off with hype, the kind of tech crunch of initiation. You know, you've kind of just got funding, you've been featured in tech crunch or in Capital, or, you know, Lubin's just invested in you and you're kind of his darling and you're, uh, you know, he's taking you everywhere and, you know, you're kind of... Um, but that, the reality is that that really wears off after a couple of weeks um, or a couple of months or a couple of days, depending on what it is. Um, you know, you get back to reality and all of this is hype. You, you haven't actually found product market fit yet. And, you know, then you get into the trough of sorrow. You kind of go through those kind of initial phases where, you know, you, you're iterating, you're kind of trying to figure out what people want from your product and whether, whether the product that you're building has market fit or not. And you're just constantly iterating. And, uh, you know, the reality is that that takes time. And, you know, you, you're kind of releasing things and you believe in this one big vision and, you know, you're going to release this feature that's going to change everything. And then you release it and it just fails, it flops. And you get to the crash of ineptitude. You know, this is the area where most startups just give up. Um, but if you don't give up and if 
you do believe in that vision and if you know you are on that right track potentially um, you can kind of get to the wiggles of false hope um, you know and begin to find the product market fit um, if you're able to do that and if you're able to get get to that you know the promised land is kind of near and you know you begin to transition and grow you found the product market fit and what's next is kind of figuring out how to grow as a company the trough of sorrow is very much about feelings you know everything here is related to feelings um, it's it's pretty difficult to go through this um, and it's it's an emotional journey you know you've got to persevere you've got to you know there are really dark days I mean as an entrepreneur you've hired you've got funding you've hired you know 15 20 people and you're going through this and you know you're here and you kind of realize that things are going badly you've got you know fifty thousand dollars left in the bank and you've got these 15 people and you can't pay them their salaries next month I mean this is an emotional journey it's it's difficult and you know that's that's what perseverance and belief is about whereas I think Brian Balfour translates this very well into um, a framework for startup growth you know the first phase and the kind of the, the left hand side of, of that trough is kind of traction you know in the first phase you're thinking about kind of product market fit and that's your main kind of ambition as, as a business you're trying to find product market fit and your key metric is retention you know you're trying to figure out whether people actually use and want the product and then you move on to transition where you're kind of turning up that faucet you know you're making less kind of crazy pivots and macro changes to the to the platform or whatever you're building and you're kind of beginning to optimize and you're beginning to discover that one channel that will really give you growth and in the growth phase you know you you're beginning to kind of unleash that fire hose you know you're beginning to learn the lifetime value of your customers and you can begin to to turn it up so I'd like to tell you about my experiences with open buildings and clippings um, I'm in no way in front of you today uh, kind of saying that we're here but we've definitely gone through a lot of this so I hope that some of my experiences will be helpful basically while I was studying architecture in London, um, I was kind of doing a lot of research about buildings. Um, I realized that there was actually, you know, whilst doing that, I realized that there was actually no, um, no kind of way for you to, to discover information about buildings online. Um, and that kind of got me thinking. So, Luchu, Tom and I um, kind of got together and we, we decided to kind of create this platform where uh, you could kind of discover buildings online. You know, we wanted to help people discover and design beautiful spaces as a vision, um, but ultimately it was an archive of buildings um, worldwide. And, you know, we started working. Three, four months later, we had a prototype of open buildings kind of up and running. Um, we were able to hustle and find 10 interns from universities all around the UK to kind of add all this content for us for free. Um, so in a couple of weeks, you know, we had thousands of buildings on the platform. Um, things were going well traffic was picking up it was kind of it was it was good um, we we launched our buildings iPhone app uh, a couple of a couple of months later and I woke up in the middle of the night because my email my phone just kept in like buzzing and what had happened was that we were featured by Apple which is kind of a huge surprise um, and basically our servers had crashed so I kept on getting all these emails um, you know kind of uh, alerting me of that and you know that felt really good it was it was amazing you know we suddenly had tens and tens of thousands of downloads of our of our app you know people loved it um, <coughs> we applied to the Intel challenge in Bulgaria and we ended up winning um, that took us to the um, kind of Intel challenge in Europe where we also won so we became Intel startup of the year in 2010 for Europe and you know the next phase was the world were the world finals in um, San Francisco so you know we we're put on a plane and kind of uh, went to San Francisco didn't win anything there but uh, before we went to San Francisco we decided that we'd list an angel list um, which is which kind of was was amazing for us and one of the persons that got in touch was Gary Kremen who is the founder of sex.com and match.com and he basically wanted to invest in open buildings so the first person that we met was was him and uh, he was waiting for us he was waiting for us in um, in a Jeep uh, outside one of the Caltrain stations you know we didn't really know what he'd look like and he said you know when you see me you'll recognize me um, so basically we, we get off the train and we see this guy by a Jeep in a Bulgaria t-shirt he had like a, a blue Bulgaria t-shirt it's like okay that's the guy <laughs> um, basically it turns out that he's married to a Bulgarian so I'm guessing that he just uh, 
you know, got in touch because we had that Bulgarian connection, so he found it interesting. And that meeting went terribly. I mean, literally, you know, we spent an hour of him telling us that we're going to fail and it's going to be terrible and we need to move to San Francisco to raise funding and, you know, it's like we'll move there and we'll be looking for money for a year and then we'll probably give up and, like, it was absolutely terrible. So Tom and I were feeling really, really down after this meeting. Um, and we had, a, we had a scheduled meeting a couple of minutes uh, or a couple of hours after that with John Malloy from Blue Run Ventures. Um, so, you know, we went in there with uh, kind of a lot of doubt, I guess. But um, after a 20-minute presentation, John basically committed to investing in us. Uh, we wanted $800,000, and he said, that's all good, but what you want is way too little. So uh, come back on Monday and throw everything away and just give me a number. So we flew to Vegas to think about it. We kind of thought, thought th <laughs> we, we thought long and hard, and then uh, on Monday we decided that we wanted two million dollars. Um, so we shook hands. Uh, I mean, it was literally that. Um, a couple of months later, or a couple of weeks later, actually, uh, Index Ventures had also gotten in touch with us, and um, you know we we got them involved. So basically, Index Ventures and Blue Run Ventures invested in uh, in open buildings at that point. The money hit the bank on uh, the eighth of February, two thousand eleven. That really pisses me off. <laughs> um, and the previous day balance was that. So things were really tight. Um, and it felt really, really good. <laughs> um, but ultimately, you know, the journey had just started. Um, you know, the money hits the bank, you kind of party, uh, but that's when it starts. And suddenly it becomes serious. You know, suddenly you have investors and you need to be able to, to deliver your promises. So, we spent the next two months working on our launch strategy. We kind of decided to redesign open buildings and, you know, recode it from scratch because actually we now have money and we're going big, so, you know, we needed to do that. Well, that's what we thought. Um, and then we had our big moment on the 12th of April, 2011. We were featured in TechCrunch, our, our funding was, was announced, and, you know, we were there. I mean, literally, we had the TechCrunch of initiation. Um, and, you know, that's our traffic graph. It is the trough of sorrow by open buildings. You know, that curve is literally that. Um, so we started kind of chugging along. Um, a couple of weeks later, we launched our Android app. We're featured by Google in the Play Market. We're kind of the number one spot at the top, which gave us over 2 million downloads. And, you know, things really felt good. I mean, things were um, kind of going really well. We had really big plans with open buildings. You know, we, we wanted to be the kind of mother of all architecture building sites online. We wanted to be everything for everyone who had anything to do with buildings. You know, we're kind of going to help tourists and people who loved architecture and locals who, you know, had kind of wanted to discover what's being built around them and professionals to kind of help them find new business online. It was, you know, a crazy, amazing vision. And, uh, you know, on paper, everything looked good. Like, this is, this is a deck, this is a slide out of a presentation deck that I just took out, you know. Things were looking really amazing. We kind of had all these features that we were going to launch, and you know, we're discussing partnerships with Google and Microsoft. They kind of wanted to integrate open buildings into Google Maps and all of that. The numbers were looking good. It was it was kind of high flying. But we were definitely in the trough of sorrow. That those were the numbers. Um, you know, that's all the hype. These were the numbers. Um, you know, it was kind of steady, steady uh, flatness. Um, so. You know, obviously, we decided that we've got to hire a product manager. Um, we kind of hired somebody from, uh, from Microsoft. He was a product manager of Bing Mobile. We kind of showed him Bulgarian hospitality, kind of flew him over here. Um, and, you know, his role was to kind of help us expand in the US, even though we didn't have a business yet. Um, so that was a really good decision. Um, and, you know, we started launching the features that we'd planned, kind of. In, 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 that, in that roadmap. Um, you know, we had wiggles and spikes, so we had some things that really worked, and then, you know, we were back to kind of zero again. Um, but basically nothing really caught on, you know, and the direction of, of open buildings was moving far away from our vision. And, you know, again, knowing that vision for us was really important because it helped us make, it helped us make really difficult decisions. We, we were kind of in the middle of that trough of sorrow. At the end of 2011, we realized that we needed to focus. You know, we're kind of building way too much, and uh, we just had to focus. So we made, we made a really difficult decision to pivot to clippings.com. Um, you know, we, we wanted to revolutionize the way that business was done in construction, but the reality was that it still runs on handshakes and Rolodexes. We kind of realized that we needed to get consumers involved in, um, 
in the whole story. And we wanted to create a B2C service that helped homeowners create beautiful spaces. And just open buildings wasn't the place to do that. It was too broad and too general. So we launched clippings.com in early 2012. Um, when we started Clippings, Clippings ultimately was a Pinterest for architecture and design. The idea was that you could clip different images of spaces and products that you liked, create folders, and uh, you know, ultimately send those, send those folders as design briefs to architects and designers um, to get quotes and you know, get on your way to start working. Um, we spent a really big part of the year iterating kind of talking to customers, you know, launching features, um, and, and just trying to kind of get traction with the product. But we weren't growing as fast as we wanted to. Um, I think at one point we realized that we we're trying to create a marketplace model, but we had a fundamental flaw in that the frequency of you searching for an architect and interior designer is really low. And you know, if you, if you do find one at one point, um, the likelihood is that if you've got a second project, which again is very unlikely, um, you'll probably work with the same person. So uh, we just didn't have that growth that we wanted. And you know, we didn't have that growth, but there was a glimmer of hope. Um, we kind of discovered that people really loved these kind of images of spaces where they can find specific products and kind of buy them. We found that because Clippings was very curated as a marketplace or uh, as, as, a, as a platform, um, people really love to kind of discover products um, on the site. So basically, we, we realized that, again, we had to strip down and focus and kind of really get down to that one key thing that, that works. So Clippings became a, became a curated marketplace and is a curated marketplace for beautiful homeware and furniture. Basically, designers, brands, and retailers can open up shops on Clippings and sell their amazing stuff, um, and we take a commission on sales. So we don't handle fulfillment or anything like that. We're a bit like Etsy, um, but you know, in a very specific niche, and it's all about furniture and homeware. So at the end of 2012, we launched a bit of a scam to kind of test that concept. Um, we launched a site which looked like a shopping site and looked like a marketplace, but you can actually buy anything here. So it was, you know, it, we had thousands and thousands of images. Everything had a buy it button, and every time you click on the buy it button, it'd take you to another site where you could buy it. But we religiously focused on tracking that metric and figuring out how many people were clicking on that button. And that was key to us. And, you know, things were suddenly going really well. We kind of realized that the conversion was great. There was a lot of retention. People were loving the product. You know, people were actually buying things from, or buying things from third-party sites after clicking on them from clippings. Um, there's one issue <laughs> in that we were running out of cash very, very rapidly. So, uh, you know, we, we went back to our investors and kind of convinced them that we were onto something big, um, you know, by religiously focusing on that one metric and kind of showing how we're optimizing for it. It worked we kind of managed to get them on board. Um, so Index and Blue Run invested in us again, but it was really close. I haven't actually shown this even to, to the team. That's us receiving money. That's basically what we had left. So, um, you know, at the end of April, we probably wouldn't, uh, basically, if we didn't raise that money, we probably would have shut down. Um, so it was very, very close, um, but we managed to do it. So Clippings today is doing really well. Um, in the past couple of months, we've kind of signed on 400 unique designers, brands, and retailers. We have over 7,000 products that are sold directly on the site, so you can actually buy things now on Clippings. Um, and you know, 7,000 products is quite a lot. Um, it already makes us one of the top kind of furniture retailers online in the UK. Um, revenue is picking up really well as well. So, you know, we're seeing kind of pretty significant growth in terms of revenue. Things are currently going well. Um, we've kind of had over 100% month-on-month growth over the past couple of months. Um, we set up an office in London, but now it's kind of planned. Um, you know, we've, we have a team of design scouts there that are kind of looking for new designers and brands to, to join Clippings, and we're able to hire a really amazing kind of marketing director from one of, one of the biggest online furniture retailers today that a lot of you have probably, probably heard of. Um, so so things, things, are, things, are going things are going really well at the moment. Um, the question is, you know, where are we? Are we in the wiggles of false hope? Or have we kind of moved on to the promised land? And I think time will, time will tell, but obviously our belief is that vision and perseverance will, will get us here. So to kind of summarize, after you get the cash, you really need to focus on finding product market fit. That needs to be your priority, especially in the beginning. Um, you know, you, you, need to, you need to get to a point where the product that you've built 
is kind of loved by your users and where retention exists. Um, so that, that needs to be your number one priority. I really think that failing fast and the minimum viable product is bullshit. I, I was a big believer in this um, a couple of months, years ago. But ultimately, I think today you need to trust your gut, not advice conferences and books. The reality is that you don't know what minimum is. You don't know what viable is. You need to just do it, and you need to create a product that is focused and you know, that looks good and that works well and that isn't the bare bones thing that people just don't use because it is the bare bones thing. Um, so I, I, I really think that you, know, you need to just get it out there. You, you shouldn't scale prematurely. You know, we made bad decisions in hiring um, the kind of product manager from Microsoft. We made bad decisions in kind of you know, pumping in marketing dollars into open buildings before a business actually existed. Uh, you, 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 shouldn't, you shouldn't do any of that. You, know, you should focus on finding that product market fit and then move on to the transition and growth phase. And you need to love your investors. Um, you know, these are the people that have supported you and that have believed in you and you know, they believed in your vision. Um, smart investors invest in teams and not in, not in products or services. Um, you know, they'll invest in you because they believe that you will persevere and you will achieve your vision at some point. Um, you know, if, if things aren't going well, you shouldn't kind of cut off your investors and not update them and kind of just you know, be scared of, of talking to them. You need to talk to them because there are people that will help. You know, in our case, it, it was amazing for us. You know, we spent $2 million and nothing happened and then they invested in us more. Um, and you shouldn't believe in your own hype. You know, you, you need to trust numbers and not hype. Um, you, ne you need to kind of be metrics driven as a startup. You, you know, you shouldn't kind of start looking for press before you have product market fit. Um, you, you, you need to focus on finding it before you grow. And ultimately, you need to be honest with yourself. You know, you need to be honest about whether your vision is actually practical and real. Um, you need to be honest with yourself about whether you're the team that is going to execute that vision. And if you believe in all that, then you need to persevere. And you know, you shouldn't be scared of failing. Uh, if you believe in that vision and you know you reckon that that's that's it, then then just do it. You know, everyone will think that you're an idiot. That's fine because you know that you have that vision and you just you just got to persevere. Or you just take the cash and you run. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the inspiring lecture. Uh, it was quite interesting to me. Um, do you have questions, guys? So we have a couple of minutes left. Hi. My question is, what ha happened with uh, buildings.com? Um, with openbuildings.com? Mm. Yes. Uh, open buildings still exists. Um, you know, we're basically just, it's just running. Uh, I'm an architect in general, as I said. So for me, open buildings, just as a kind of basic resource, as a kind of Wikipedia for architecture, is really important. And, you know, it's actually growing in terms of numbers and usage and traffic. So people do like the platform. But as a business, it's not where we want to be. You know, and we realized that as a business, um, what we wanted to do was to help architects and designers find new clients. But open buildings just wasn't relevant for that. So it, it exists. We don't make any money. There's no advertising. You know, it costs us a couple of thousand dollars per month to maintain. And we're happy with that. Other questions? Congrats uh, on the excellent uh, lecture. Uh, can you tell us what exactly do you understand, do you understand by product market, market fit? Um, getting to a point where you believe that the product that you've built is really loved by the users um, that, that, you, that you're ultimately looking for. And it's about figuring out what curve of growth you want, you know, whether it's that or it's that, because you know, maybe you've built a product that is used by 10,000 users and, you know, you're happy with that. And, you know, there's a product market fit with 10,000 users, but maybe you wanted to build a product that has a product market fit with a billion users. You know, you just need to figure that out in your head and it, it depends on that vision. But ultimately, it's just getting to a point where people, uh, where there's retention. I mean, that, that is a key metric. You know, there's retention. People come and use your product daily or weekly or, you know, whatever it is, um, it's, it's retention.
more questions? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. uh, hi. Uh, did you manage to go to the zero of your investments? Did you fulfill the requirements of your investors and did you earn Sorry, these? Sorry, I can barely hear you. Did you earn these two millions in the first investors uh, around and other that, did you fulfill the investors' uh, want of cash that they invested in you? <laughs> uh, no, we spent the $2 million and didn't give them a penny back. Um, <laughs> so, but you know. is, he, is, he earn, uh, is he earning from your company? Not yet, but hopefully okay. they will. How do you feel about uh, running online business and offline business? Um, I mean, um, the effort you put in clippings.com as an online business and the effort you put in offline businesses like Boom Burger, uh, would you invest again or uh, start another offline business like that? Um, I think that's really personal in terms of decision making process. You need to do what you love. If what you do, if, if what you love is, you know, creating some kind of tech product that is online, then do it. You know, you shouldn't create something offline if you're not passionate about it. I think for me, it's what you're passionate about. You know, obviously the internet at the moment is, or kind of tech in general is going through a huge kind of growth phase. Um, so th there is a lot of opportunity and you can very quickly, you know, reach many more people than you can if you've got a restaurant in Sofia. Um, but ultimately I, I love Boom. Um, I, I love like, just the experience of, of opening up a restaurant. I'm a huge foodie in general, so it's fine for me. Um, so yeah, it's it's just what you're passionate about, I think. Uh, one question. So how do the the visions of you and uh, and your uh, potential partner align? I mean, they they could be different, and uh, where do they meet? I mean, the they 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 shouldn't meet. You're the entrepreneur, you have the vision. If you find a partner who where the vision aligns, then you're great partners. If the visions don't align, then you shouldn't be partners. Uh, that's Sometimes what I think. there are some conflicts, and uh, do you meet in uh, kind of where the metrics? Um, to be honest, I've, uh, you know, all of my business partners are also very close friends, so, uh, you know, uh, we kind of, before we set out to do something, we try and align vision. If, if we don't, then, you know, we try and separate or, you know, uh, for me, it's no point in, in creating a partnership with somebody where, or with, with people where, you know, your visions don't align. If, if they don't align, then you need to align them or it'll probably fail. Thanks. Okay. Adele, thank you very much for thank opening you. up the second day. Big applause.